everyone. Thanks to Andrew, thanks to the conference organizers for having us. Um, so I'm Brooke Harris, this is my colleague Jen here, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, an experimental recording app that we found the need for through, uh, tangentially sort of through other research on police homicide data. So I'm going to go ahead and launch into it now. So UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles students and faculty have faced ongoing issues with harassment by the University of Los Angeles Police Department. So in 2006, the UCLA, uh, UCLA PD officer was caught on camera repeatedly chasing a Muslim American student for not showing his Bruin card or his student ID. Um, and then in recent years, there have been other incidents of racial, gender, ability discrimination against students. And the work that we're talking about here is a result of student and faculty claims that we heard through the research. Um, of uh, claims of discrimination by the UCLA PD. And the UCLA PD is sort of a unique and specific animal. It's a statewide law enforcement agency that functions within the UC system and operates much like that of the California Highway Patrol, but it only has minimal University of California and UCLA oversight. So students and faculty that talk to us through our research project um, had gone through the appropriate channels to address discrimination, but uh, they reported that in some cases it kept happening, and in other cases it kept happening to the same individual. So this work that we're talking about here is a meditation on meeting power with power, or in other words, meeting the power of law enforcement with the power of statistical and qualitative data um, as discursive tools of presentation and interpretation in order to reverse or sort of question uh, and call attention to this trend of UCLA uh, Police Department campus discrimination. So in so doing, we draw from relevant literature in the areas of legal storytelling, critical race theory, and legal studies regarding data management to build a theoretical basis for the design and dissemination of a UCLA PD harassment reporting tool that we might uh, then sort of work with other campuses to um, roll out if, if there was a, a need for this. So the works that we present in uh, this first section show how concepts of data relate to the legitimization and power of personal experience. Um, so in light of recent events, it suggests law enforcement training and practices should be rethought and the realization that in part there's very little data to hold police accountable. Critics of using data to expose these practices have been pushing back, stating, for example, you can read on this slide, that the statistics that statistics should be considered a technology of mistrust. So our previous work deals with these questions of who has the authority to collect and classify data in these situations, as well as how it's disseminated, how it's described, and the values that underlie these endeavors. In our previous work on police officer-involved homicide data, we noted a significant gap in the ability of those most affected by the creation and dissemination of data and holding uh, <coughs> positions of power, agency, and authority over these processes involving data. So the areas of legal storytelling and critical race studies are uh, informative for our goals. One important work in this interstitial area of scholarship is Gloria Anseldua's 1987 Fronteras, uh, which suggests scholars find new ways to rewrite histories that are more sensitive to race, class, gender, and ethnicity as categories of analysis that recognize the positions of in-betweenness in lived experience. So critical race theorists consider that a principal obstacle to racial reform is that uh, of the majoritarian mindset, or the bundle of presuppositions, received wisdoms, and shared cultural understandings persons in the dominant group bring to discussions of race. And according to critical race theorists, uh, Delgado and Stefanczyk, in order to, uh, and this is a quote, analyze and challenge these power-laden beliefs, writers um, and interested parties can employ counter stories, parables, chronicles, and anecdotes aimed at revealing their contingency, cruelty, and self-serving nature. So these methods of understanding how and why narratives are important in promoting positive social change and social justice issues are uh, at the core of conceptualizing our project and serve as the sort of key theoretical underpinnings for how we have approached our research process. Um, 
So this issue of data as evidence uh, is something that I'm going to get into a little bit here. So data has been called upon as forensic evidence that encapsulates the true processes of the world, both for state and activist purposes. And we all know that, uh, you know, as we've been at the Data Power Conference, you know, we could sort of problematize this to, to no end. Uh, but, you know, this is a widely held assumption. <coughs> So diplomatic scholar Luciana Durante uh, frames the forensic, relevatory qualities of objectively collected data and calls for the careful treatment of data to ensure notions of authenticity and reliability of these digital documents or data as evidence. To, and uh, she also uh, suggests that um, politicization of the data and of the data managers who are sort of working with this data that, uh, this politicization should be minimized or warded off or sort of downplayed as much as possible. Uh, so this process of establishing the authenticity and reliability of uh, electronic records and data is key to the ways in which data and statistics, like the ones of interest uh, to this talk and to our reporting tool that we're conceptualizing, um, gain legitimacy and authority among governing institutions and the public. Uh, and discussing these sort of theoretical underpinnings of the processes of authenticity and reliability are at the heart of this acceptance, this sort of wide acceptance of data as unquestionable evidence. And this is significant in the discussion of data management issues to be considered in uh, creating an application that adequately considers these concepts um, and that sort of uh, then theorizes using data in a way that best serves those who are most affected. So contemporary literature on the legal issues of mass digital storage claims that there's a high probability that records of any given document or piece of data will be um, traced through the infrastructure to users if it's necessary, if it's deemed necessary by a governing body. Both in the case of digital data stores held by the users themselves and in the case of third-party data storage, the extent of subpoena power increasingly rests on the question of uh, the necessary specificity of any given prosecutorial request for documents. As digital information is increasingly seen as useful in court cases, judicial bodies and commentators have suggested application of rules for analog documents to be applied to uh, digital documents. And um, sort of going back to Durante's notion of archival evidence that holds this notion of neutrality or the sort of depoliticization of data uh, as essential in data management, and that ar archivists and data man managers must resist politicization at all costs. Um, you know, there are many people, including archival scholar Terry Cook, who challenges these notions and contends that archives, archivists, and data managers are situated, obviously, by nature of their work, within a constellation of practices, social and legal requirements, um, and are bound to systems of politics and economics, which makes it impossible for archives to be apolitical and irresponsible to argue that they would be anything but that. Um, this can also be seen in Jimerson's 2009 archival power, as he claims that archives, and um, he argues in that sort of, by extension, databases, have political power because they can be considered evidence in any number of processes that can be used to shape discourse. So there are many cases in which data uh, can also be captured and saved indefinitely to the detriment on the, of those upon whom the data is collected. So just one sort of uh, uh, frame of reference here is Jean-Francois Blanchette's and Deborah Johnson's piece on privacy and data that suggests that while some data is transient and changes over time, other types of data are saved and made permanent. And in these sort of uh, issues or cases of permanent data, um, there are issues of anticipatory governance, control creep, um, shaping, shaping discourse, um, and shaping discourse maybe in the way that it, the data was not intended to uh, you know, function in that way, as well as the right to be forgotten. We hope to propose a method for recording and managing data on police harassment on UCLA campus uh, in a way that appropriately considers these <coughs> concerns and resists authoritative power dynamics to do so. We recognize that statistics and data collection are often an integral part of recognizing and addressing incidents of police harassment and propose the application uh, considered in the rest of our talk as an example of an informed approach to data management that seeks to navigate the concerns around institutional data and statistics that are currently in place. 
And while our goal here is not really to develop archives per se, the data that we are gathering or hope to gather through this application and the data management practices that we are looking at um, fall closely in line with the aforementioned thinking on archives and social justice. And based on the different types of literatures that we've reviewed, we expect that the construction and impl implementation of this tool would bring attention to and facilitate discussion and policy with regard to police harassment on campuses broadly and on UCLA campus in particular. So, uh, this was our primary research question, or sort of the one that we'll be addressing with these three case studies. Um, which is, uh, you know, how can we ensure that this data is transparent enough to be used effectively to promote a social justice agenda, and simultaneously it's not easily co-opted by the, those who wish to use this data to detract from a social justice agenda. And so our methodology uh, that Jen's going to talk a little bit more about involves a selection of three case studies that expose both potential routes for data management for social justice, as well as setbacks and issues that may arise particularly in the legal sector. And we uh, use these areas of legal storytelling, critical race studies, and legal studies to frame our analysis. And I'm going to hand it off to Jen to discuss these. Case studies. Okay. Um, so our three case studies kind of cover and um, reveal three main takeaways that I'll discuss at the end. Um, they center on institutionalized collection of data through ACLU applications, um, as well as community-based reporting, um, and what grassroots collection and dissemination of statistics data around police harassment can look like. And lastly, um, the Apple iPhone case as a, a central, um, a way to reveal a central theme around legal complications and implications of um, the handling and management of sensitive data. So, in our first case study, we analyzed two specific applications within the ACLU purview. Um, the first is the ACLU Stop and Frisk Watch app which was created in 2012 um, as a tool that, that functions to record, listen, and report incidents of police harassment. Uh, the record component of the tool, um, this is kind of a layout, visual layout of it, um, allows the user to capture audio-visual footage of an incident, uh, whereas the listen function also alerts the user to when people in their area are being stopped by police so they're able to kind of inform um, areas in which incidents are prevalent. And lastly, the report feature allows the user to describe the encounter that they witness and provide more contextual information around it. The Stop and Frisk Watch app settings also allow the user to provide uh, additional metadata around their name, phone number, and email, but as we'll discuss in the final case study around legal implications, um, there is a disclaimer that warns there may be situations where the NYCLU may be legally required to disclose this information, such as when the NYCLU receives a subpoena. And this concern is increasingly palpable around stories of surveillance and profiling of activists um, in conjunction with the Black Lives Matter movement and other similar um, organizations. And so we're seeing both of these ACLU applications as examples of direct collection of data through an institutionalized setting and a primary authority organization. The second tool that we consider in the ACLU case study is the Mobile Justice app, which was derived from the NYCLU application and came online and was introduced in 2015, particular to the California area. It similarly collects and stores video and written data so that's submitted through the smartphone application with regard to police harassment, but specifically in California. And while the record and report components and features of the application remain the same, uh, it does not leverage the listen function, so that piece is missing, uh, which is concerning for a uh, reason I'll explain in a few minutes. So the Mobile Justice CA app also sends these videos and reports directly to the ACLU to be considered um, and used as a seen fit by the organization. However, something that's also particular to the Mobile Justice CA app is that no legal action they claim is taken by the ACLU unless an explicit request is made, and the reports are treated as confidential and privileged legal communication. So that's a key difference between the two of them. However, they are shared often by ACLU news <coughs> media, community organizations, and or the general public to help call attention to um, issues of police brutality and police harassment. So the Watch TA app is intended for those directly being interrogated by the police, which uh, in some parts, in some points, explains why the listen function was left out, the listen feature was left out of this particular application as opposed to its use by bystanders and, and other 
interested stakeholders. And this becomes uh, concerning, especially due to the adopted practices of taking phones and deleting reported content um, of the encounter on the uh, basis of police. So through an analysis of the tools currently available under the ACLU jurisdiction, we're able to kind of view a landscape of current efforts um, and current instantiations of an application um, from which we can draw a sort of model to, for which to move forward. And the tool that we envision is distinct from the ACLU's watch app in the information it records and the jurisdiction it serves in terms of its um, particularities to campus efforts. And as I'll describe through the next case studies, its connection to um, more closely uh, leveraged community knowledge and community use for shaping the statistical information available. So our second case study involves community-based reporting applications, and this builds a lot off our previous work um, with the police officer involved homicide data in the Los Angeles County area. So we found in our research that some of the best kept qualitative data on national police brutality is collected by local activist groups and newspapers. Two of the largest, killed by police.net, fatal encounters are both civilian efforts. And the LA Times homicide report and the Youth Justice Coalition collected database um, were two very integral pieces um, of collected data that we found um, that had kind of the, least uh, the least gaps available to work with and introduced to the community. And so we see these examples um, as spaces that allow for more interactive and accessible data collection rather than it being funneled through a particular authoritative institution, um, which also provides different perspective and approaches for handling and disseminating statistical information in a way that involves legal storytelling um, and personal narr narrative shaping as informed by our literature review. <coughs> um, the Los Angeles Times homicide report corroborates police reports with coroner's reports, as does the YJC, the Youth Justice Coalition, um, but both of them are also supplemented by additional investigative reporting. In the case of the YJC, they actually go door to door um, and interview people that are directly involved with and affected by um, areas where victims were killed. And so we see this as a really impactful way to be uh, building on the model of the app that we see all the in terms of better collecting and more efficiently um, utilizing community knowledge and input. So our last case study centers on the Apple iPhone case, especially in terms of how it relates to issues of authenticity and reliability and how data is used as evidence, as we discussed on the literature review. So as all of you are probably aware of, in February 2016, there was a case brought up by the California magistrate that compelled Apple to assist the government in designing a sort of technical bypass um, for gaining information on the iPhone 56 that was used by one of the perpetrators of the San Bernardino attack in December 2015. Um, and this case gained a lot of traction because Tim Cook, the CEO, responded in a strongly worded statement um, that called the order a dangerous precedent. In the end, the government received help from a third party, a serious third party, and so questions of the ways in which this data was going to be used as evidence um, and the role that Apple had to play in this and the infrastructure was remained unresolved. However, through this case, um, we do believe that it demonstrates many implications for how to navigate the current information and technical, technological landscape in terms of how to appropriately consider and maintain an awareness of the legal implications and difficulties that arise when handling uh, sensitive data and information around uh, data's evidence. So in conclusion, uh, we provide a number of recommendations to use um, as key tenants to move forward with the design of an application for community-based um, and campus-based police harassment reporting. Um, that will essentially balance increased visibility, promoting increased visibility of particular issues with campus police, while also simultaneously protecting those that are most affected. So drawing from literature and legal storytelling, we hope that um, these pieces and the analysis and the framework of our literature review around legal storytelling and uh, data management issues, that we can provide an outlet for stories to be made public under the right circumstances and in the right scenarios. Um, that effectively navigates and interfaces with community members that are providing this data um, on their lived experiences. So some of these key tenets include um, instituting a reporting app that functions similar to the ACLU's watch app, drawing from their technical model where all information is encrypted um, and can be used uh, directly with 
the ACLU um, through a private server. Second, um, a web administrator being uh, a key personnel that consults with those that are uh, contributing and volunteering their own data in terms of how they would like to shape their narrative and participate in the storytelling around their own incidents. And lastly, um, cre creating a platform and ensuring that a part of the platform allows victims to share their story and manage their content in a way that protects their anonymity. And so we hope that um, overall there is uh, a space for negotiating the scale and the extent to which um, those on campus who are heavily affected by police harassment incidents are able to share their narratives while enabling agency, um, which is key to this whole project of data management for social justice. Okay, um, so the title of my talk is Semantic Web as an Experimental System. Um, I'm at Red Square College. Um, so, many in the semantic web community have described to me that a semantic web was Tim Berners-Lee's vision for the World Wide Web from the very beginning. That we don't <coughs> produce much knowledge from hyperlinking web pages, as the web origi originally engineered does, as it does right here. Um, such hyperlinking only tells us in computers that some piece of data on a web page is somehow related to another piece of data on another web page. Instead, the vision for the semantic web was to link data points within and between web pages, describing their relationships in languages that computers can interpret. Berners-Lee made his first public reference to the semantic web during his talk at the International World Wide Web Conference held at CERN in 1994. He wrote in his talk, and this is, these are slides that he used to contextualize this quote, um, based on hypertext to a computer, then, the web is flat, boring, devoid of meaning. This is a pity, as in fact, documents on the web describe real-world objects and imaginary concepts and give particular relationships between them. Adding semantics to the web involves two things, allowing documents uh, which have information in machine-readable forms and allowing links to be created with relationship values. Only when we have this extra level of semantics will we be able to use computer power to help us exploit the information to a greater extent than our own reading. At the same conference, the formation of the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, which is the governing body for the World Wide Web, was announced. Semantic web researchers aim to design information infrastructures for adding machine-readable meaning to web data in order to make the web smarter, to enable a web that not only presents information, but also understands it. They hope that in doing so, we can better interlink and share data on the web, improve web search, and build smart agents that can sort and make sense of diverse web data. In the mid to late 1990s, developing the standards, protocols, and data ontologies for linking and eventually reasoning with web data points was largely distributed work. The technologies needed to enable the semantic web were commonly conceived in a series of layers, beginning with the technologies needed to uniquely identify data points, and then moving on to the infrastructures needed to format them, link them, describe their relationships, and eventually reason with them. The research description framework, RDF, was designed to allow the uh, data on the web to be formatted into triples, with a subject, a data point with a unique <coughs> URI, a predicate describing a relationship, and an object, another data point, or a reference to a real-world object. You can see here that in this example that they give, Mona Lisa would be a data point perhaps on Wikipedia. Um, they would describe their relationship as the creator, and then another data point on the web with a unique URI in order to mention. The web ontology language was designed to formalize the predicates in these triples, enabling the computer to interpret how, how data points are related to one another. So, for instance, you might be able to say that a data point was the same as another data point on the web, or was somehow um, her, had some kind of hierarchical relationship to another data point on the web. Designing what would become the worldwide standard for representing web knowledge was enticing for many different stakeholders such as artificial intelligence researchers and logicians seeking to advance global knowledge representation systems, and information technology corporations seeking to improve web search. With participants geographically dispersed, much of the work planning uh, semantic web infrastructures was conducted on W3C mailing, uh, group mailing lists, mailing lists that remain publicly accessible today. Um, as part of my field work, I peru perused these mailing lists extensively following the conversations and arguments that arose. Um, in field work, I learned that within the semantic web community, there has been considerable debate over the role of formal logic in designing knowledge representation systems for the web, as well as the value of consistency in producing an interlinked web. 
Does everyone in the world need to agree on how data points relate to one another in order for the semantic web to achieve global data integration? Does everyone need to use data formats and ontologies in the same way uh, exactly in order to produce valuable semantic systems? What happens when people on the web use semantics incorrectly or in misleading ways? What happens when people disagree on the semantics? So historical and ethnographic work on knowledge representation communities in the 1990s often critiqued the work as being a social, a cultural, and masculinist. For example, in 1993, Diana Forsyth described the practice of knowledge engineering through an ethnographic study of an AI lab. Borrowing from Susan Lee Starr the idea that computer scientists tend to delete the social, which she cited as personal communication, Forsyth argued that knowledge engineers also tend to delete the cultural, understanding knowledge through purely logical rules. Allison Adam concurred with Forsyth, arguing that knowledge engineers take knowledge to be universal and absolute, and never question the political dimensions of their work. Jeffrey Bauker and Susan Lee Starr's work on the politics of classifications <coughs> has guided more recent ethnographic work on knowledge representation communities. Perhaps most notably, their argument that the act of delimiting knowledge uh, shapes what becomes knowable has inspired more recent examinations of the semantic web by folks like uh, Matthew McCarthy, by Susan Halford, um, Catherine Pope and Mark Wheel, and by uh, Vivian Waller. However, even amongst the most traditional knowledge engin engineers, knowledge on the World Wide Web is not considered universal and absolute. The web was designed with a commitment to radical decentralization. The web can be referred to as what anthropologist Michael J. Fisher calls a soft infrastructure, one that is open to emergent forms of life. A soft infrastructure enables experimental systems, systems that leave open the possibility for iterating from rather than reproducing culture. In building knowledge representation on top of a soft infrastructure, the semantic web community has become entwined in this experimental system. Okay. Uh, logic's law of an excluded middle, A or not A, does not hold or even make sense in such an experimental system. To do knowledge representation in ways that enable knowledge to iterate and transform, semantic web researchers and practitioners have had to develop uh, experimental strategies. In my field work, I have found that in building ontologies for the semantic web, researchers and practitioners have developed a functional semiotics for describing the ways in which conflicting cultures within their communities have shaped semantic web infrastructure. Bi binaries often characterize disparate ways of thinking about what constitute knowledge and how best to represent it. <coughs> Yet much like how designing frameworks for knowledge representation on top of the web's soft infrastructure has challenged the law of the excluded middle, the work has also pushed semantic web researchers and practitioners to begin charting the muddled middle between the binaries they've used to describe their work. In doing so, culture has been foregrounded in the way that they talk about knowledge representation work. And this has impacted the design of the infrastructure in notable ways. In this essay, I show how soft infrastructures challenge functional semiotics and in doing so, enable experimentation in making sense of data. So in the mid to late 1970s, Roger Schenk, a prominent computer scientist and natural language processing researcher, called out a long-standing opposition in the field of artificial intelligence, a battle between what he referred to as the needs and the scruffies. Needs working in the tradition of John McCarthy and Nils Nielsen tended to seek formal, clean, consistent, and complete solutions to AI problems. They believed that the world should be modeled with neat and well-defined semantics to correctly characterize the internal workings of the system. Scruffies, on the other hand, working in the tradition of researchers like Marvin Minsky and Roger Schenk, uh, asserted that the world was too messy to model formally or consistently. For them, building computer intelligence was less about modeling the internal workings of a system correctly and more about creating pragmatic structures and protocols for roughly but rigorously assembling AI. Pat Case, a student of John McCarthy, typically considered the most prominent neat in AI, told me that Roger Schenk, typically considered the most prominent scruffy, once referred to him as a neat with a scruffy heart. He laughed, <laughs> describing it as a great compliment. Hayes, who, anticipate, who participated in the W3C working groups for both RDF and OWL, went on to describe how this distinction has played out in the development of the semantic web. The thing is, it used to be considered a sort of almost an intellectual war in AI, and now I think it's settled down into, well, we all agree it's a matter of style, almost a personality rather than a content. But certainly both styles are clearly visible in the way things happen, and often release a friction on committees, of course. Semantic web researchers and practitioners use the classic distinctions to position, to position themselves against one another, 
telling me that so-and-so is in need or so-and-so is a scruffy. They also use it to defend their own approaches to the work. For instance, in one email thread for the development of OWL, one participant, a student of Roger Schenck, described himself as the archetypal scruffy, taking the stance that pragmatism should trump formality. Gus Gruber, co-chair of the OWL Working Group, wrote in one commentary about the semantic web, the debate about what a web ontology language should look like is reminiscent of past neat scruffy struggles. Knowledge modelers want, it, modelers want expressiveness, logicians stress decidability. The main difference is that the semantic web actually forces us to make some choices. There is a strong need for real world knowledge representation. The terms have also been used to characterize approaches to data modeling. For instance, in characterizing the three versions of OWL that were ultimately produced through the WPC working group, uh, one participant described OWL full, which is one version, to be scruffy, OWL description logic, which is another version, to be neat, and OWL light, which is the simple version, to be wimpy. Hayes went on to tell me that in the working group for OWL, he surprisingly played the role of the scruffy. I asked him if that role was uncomfortable for him. He replied, it was then because I enjoyed making my fellow neat squirm. I actually think in Roger's terminology, I started off as a lead and I've gotten scruffier as I got older. I tell him that he's not the first person that I've interviewed to tell me that. He laughed. Yeah, well, your youthful idealism gets worn off by life when you get to my age. <laughs> the web itself has been characterized to me as a scruffy architecture. There's no centralized system controlling how documents get added or deleted from the web. And without this central system, there's nothing preventing users from using protocols incorrectly or for deleting documents that have already been linked to from somewhere else on the web. This is why you sometimes navigate to a page and receive a 404 and are not found error. Berners -Lee, Berners Lee's decision to allow 404 or an error message to appear when something gets taken down has become sort of an urgent urban legend in the web community. A story that is very often referenced to acknowledge why the web won out over other hypertext systems, um, and that's because it was completely decentralized and it tolerated inconsistencies that were introduced into the infrastructure. The web became a bit scruffier in the mid-2000s, right around the time of the discourse change from the semantic web to linked data. With the emergence of popular social networking sites, blogs, content management systems, Facebook, Twitter, there were more and more web users that were publishing their own data rather than just consuming data. Um, and so many on the semantic web community viewed this as a time to take advantage of increased web publication and saw a need to shift efforts towards getting technologies for linking data into the hands of everyday webmasters, not just these highly trained logicians that could use the ontology languages. Right? So linked data discourse also carried an increased recognition that if the semantic web was to take off, it would need to embrace hacks. It would need to tolerate inconsistencies, just like the web itself. However, this pushed up against enduring efforts to make knowledge representation on the web globally consistent. Jim Handler elaborated on this issue in a 2015 interview with me. So one of the things that gets weird when you get onto the web, this is a quote from Jim, environment, is that this very precise meaning of this term, same as, when two things are exactly the same. He was referring to a property in OWL that specifies when two data points refer to the same real world thing. For instance, that a data point about Bill Clinton referred to the same real world object as a data point about William Clinton. In 2010, Halpin et al. presented a paper at the International Semantic Web Conference expressing concern over the way OWL same as was being used by webmasters to link data. The authors argued that while OWL same as had been formally and explicitly defined to ensure that only data points that were absolutely identical be linked, there was no way to guarantee that it would be properly used in the wild, in other words, by your average webmaster. The authors argued that OWL same as should be stricter, that the misuse of OWL same as had led to a philosophical crisis of identity that was turning the interconnected web of data into, and this is a quote, the equivalent of mushy peas. Hendler continued, so its usage, its pragmatics, don't actually concur with the formal specification. And that's driving a bunch of people crazy because the formalists are saying, make all those people stop doing something wrong. And us pragmatists are saying, well, let's see, there's a million of them and six of you. He left. <laughs> Please go ahead and convince them that they're wrong. <coughs> so I sat down for an interview with Christian Beiser, co-finder of DDP a prominent system for linking Wikipedia data at the 25th Worldwide Web Conference. 
I asked Pfizer if he saw any limits to achieving global data integration with linked data technologies. Pfizer referenced one of his preferred examples. He said, usually as a human, if I ask, is a village in a tunnel the same, or, um, or is a populated place in a tunnel the same, you would say no. Um, I confirmed. He noted, it's class disjointness. Class disjointness, sorry, I'm Class disjointness refers to a rule in many ontologies that specifies that two categories will never overlap, or that a data point will never be an instance of both categories. In DBpedia, architectural structures are disjoint from populated places, right? Or in this example, another example, red, white, or rosé wine would be considered disjoint because those classes would never overlap. Okay. All right, Pfizer continued. A tunnel is not a populated place, but if you look at reality, or even if you look into Wikipedia, you find that there's a tunnel in India that contains a slum. So a tunnel is a populated place. It violates your, your logical assumption, but still the logical assumption is quite useful. So if you want to cleanse web data, or even though it's only 98 or 99% true, the class disjointness helps you. But there are cases which are true which violate the axiom. So basically, I think the semantic web community thought for a long time that things would be easy, but now as we look into reality, as this example nicely illustrated, it turns out that things are not as easy as we hoped. So the pragmatic challenges of doing knowledge representation in the real world have been cited quite often in my field work. The shift in semantic web efforts towards linking data that was already out there provoked the community to revisit questions that had long been troubling their work. How can we design ontologies that are complex enough to allow for diverse knowledge representation, restrictive enough to enable formal reasoning, and simple enough for everyday webmasters to understand? Such questions have oriented the design of schema.org, <coughs> an ontology developed as part of a collaboration between major search engines since 2011. Um, I've been told that uh, I've been often told that despite schema.org's lack of logical rigor, it is what is winning out in the semantic web domain with a viral growth that other semantic web technologies never achieved. There's general consensus in the schema.org community that the schema should not become an, quote, ontology of anything, and specifically they're, they're harking back to efforts um, in AI to build out um, SIC, which was basically all of the knowledge needed to, to build this um, huge knowledge representation system that could characterize all the knowledge in a one-volume encyclopedia. Um, so it should not become an ontology of everything, listing and defining every classifier that may, may be used to characterize web content. Instead, the schema.org community is aimed to build out what they call a middle ontology, one that most webmasters will find accessible and useful. Schema.org is widely recognized to be a very lightweight ontology, and this makes working um, in some of those that are working in the neater traditions uncomfortable. Yet as one respondent said in the schema.org forum, that said, other problems that you point out, lack of documentation, semantic glitches, etc., will always be present in this scruffy work in progress called web semantics. Red fuzzy, plural, inconsistent, etc. I'm sure you will fight, uh, I'm sure you will ever, ever fight it with all your will and strength, given where you come from, but I'm afraid this battle has been lost for quite a while now. As Pat Hayes told me a while ago, my ivory tower has been seriously shaken these days. Waters from the real world are slowly rising around us. It's time to, to learn swimming in troubled waters. So, Sharon, this is a quote from Sharon Trowick, Unity, Dyads, Triads, Quotes, Complexity, Cultural Choreographies of Science. And she says that the law of the excluded middle isn't always interesting and it doesn't always hold, especially in the best compositions. There are new ways to think within and about our sciences and technologies. Let's dance. So what does it mean to design a middle information infrastructure, as they describe a middle ontology? Delimiting at the middle is perhaps a way of scoping out a middle space between neat and scruffy research genealogies, or perhaps they mean a middle space between, a struct between structure and no structure, or between an ontology of everything and an ontology of nothing, between formality and pragmatics, or between clean and messy approaches to knowledge representation. In any case, in designing the semantic web, the law of the excluded middle has not held. Researchers and practitioners have had to devise new strategies, confronting and muddling the functional semiotics that have long structured the way they talk about their thinking and about their work. Designed on top of a soft infrastructure, the World Wide Web, the semantic web has been an experimental system. As researchers and practitioners have been exposed to new collaborators, 
new base infrastructures and new representational limits, knowledge representation work has iterated towards a proliferating middle. So I've studied communities that have leveraged semantic web technologies to make it easier for those in need of human services to find relevant information, as well as to highlight communities that have been disproportionately exposed to SARS and pollutants. Such communities rely on robust information infrastructures to make data about contemporary problems more shareable um, and discoverable. Yet information infrastructures organize without attention to pluralisms as opposed to universality. And the politics of the excluded middle can render certain problems and populations invisible. We need more experimental systems to move towards data justice. As Trowick notes, repeating the same steps won't get us there. New choreographies are needed. about data as an information weapon um, based on uh, Russia's actions since 2014 um, around the world. And um, I really need to uh, give a lot of credit to my co-authors. Um, in particular, the, the lead author, uh, Volodymyr Lysenko, unfortunately couldn't be here today. And, um, and our, um, he's my fellow postdoc at the Center for Digital Society and Data Studies. Um, and our center founder, Catherine Brooks, um, is also unfortunately able to be here. Um, so they're with us in spirit. And um, I'm sure that Voldemir would love to have your thoughts. Um, if you emailed him here at Vilasenko, if you emailed at Arizona at NPU, um, just so you know, he really would rather be here than there. Um, this is the forecast um, for today. So um, it's only getting up to 108 degrees Fahrenheit today. Whereas earlier in the week it was 113, so um, and we have an Celsius for those of you who do it that way. Um, so today um, I'll just be starting to tell the story about um, some of the repeated attacks that we've seen. Um, we've seen hacks and leaks and disinformation that have uh, caused chaos around the world, and um, Russia is actually starting to use those in concert with other people. Um, so, um, attacks on infrastructure as well as military attacks. Um, and that, uh, that ability to coordinate those is somewhat troubling. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can't yet definitively say what happened. Um, unfortunately, forensic investigation um, is a difficult matter, but um, some, things, some things we do know actually took place. Um, and so, um, a lot of researchers do um, do believe that uh, Russia is behind the things that we're talking about, to, uh, that I'll be talking about today. Um, and just to give some examples, um, Volodymyr uh, could tell you much more about um, what happened in Ukraine, in his home country, um, leading up to the presidential elections of 2015, where um, uh, there was an, uh, an ally of Putin in place who was president, incumbent. and. Um, the Russian security forces were starting to um, sort of do hacking and infiltration in preparation for what might happen at that election. But instead, in, um, in late 2013, I believe, um, they, there were actually uprisings and a lot of mass protests, and then, um, and then the incumbent president left, um, left office and fled. And then um, that, right after that was when uh, Russia sort of mobilized some of its um, disinformation and its uh, attacked infrastructure, attacked um, election commission, uh, the election commission um, sort of websites, um, hacked government websites in Ukraine, all trying to um, maintain some control over this, and did this in concert with, um, with armed forces that were supposedly Russian volunteers or Russia backing Ukrainians in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, so there, and they spread disinformation around this. So um, that's one example. Another example that some experts say has Russia's fingerprints on it and we don't actually know yet is what happened last month in Qatar, where there was a hacking of a government website and, um, and they attributed to the emir um, some words that were extremely inflammatory um, to everyone else in the region. Um, 
sort of <laughs> praising Iran and Israel. And, um, and this was sort of the casa spelli for a lot of the neighbors. Um, it, was, it seems to be really a, um, a pretext. Um, and obviously the other, other governments knew that was not real. And it was quickly exposed as fake news. And yet it kept getting reported among those other countries and um, led to an impasse. Um, so far, it's not entirely clear. Russia did seem to have the, um, the tools, and uh, some people have pointed to them in this, but others say that they wouldn't have the motivation for that. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but that just gives a background of some of this. Um, in this particular presentation, we'll be zeroing in on some of the people involved, um, the personnel structures that have made this possible. So um, there are a lot of Russian soft forces now that um, basically are able to do this lower cost um, kind of attack by doing cyber warfare or information warfare. Um, and so we looked at how that started and developed and um, a few different forms of how they have that put together. Um, so there are army units, um, security services units, as well as the main civilian tools. Um, and there are others we'll touch on at the very end. Um, so the methodology for this was really looking at open sources across the web, um, interviews, uh, white papers from, um, from security agencies and other analysts around the world, um, journalism, and uh, sort of looking at what was actually already public out there and um, seeing what could be put together. Um, and I am very, very, very grateful um, this is actually um, Somewhat closely linked to Voldemir's dissertation, and um, he speaks Russian as well as Ukrainian and English, and I think some Belarusian. So, um, so yes, he is uh, he is the core of this project, and um, I'm so sorry that he can't be here today. Um, so, first, the army um, has this uh, sort of instigated a new directorate called the Eighth Directorate, and um, they realized that they needed to do more to, um, to make their communication secure and uh, fight uh, and use new technologies in warfare. So traditionally, the, this AIDS directorate seemed to be doing things like encryption and passing messages back and forth between parts of the Russian government, military, um, so dealing with secret information. And um, through the magic of the Internet Archive Wayback Machine, <laughs> Um, Voldemir was able to, uh, to see that in particular they supervised a military unit, 31659. Um, so that seems to be a particular research institution that deals with information systems um, uh, and defenses of information systems. But um, there were actually some problems that came up. Um, well, this is a problem in many senses, but um, during the invasion of Ukraine, um, some of the uh, volunteers who, who uh, were um, using I, who were using uh, weapons that seemed to come from Russia um, shot down the Malaysian Airlines passenger jet over Ukraine, and um, so obviously that's a horrible tragedy and awful. Um, and but the problem for the Russians was that there were actually communications between those rebels and Moscow that um, were um, actually picked up by the Ukrainian forces. So um, that was something that meant that the 8th Directorate had failed in its job. Um, so as part of their complex retraining after that, um, they set up new sets of courses. And um, again, through Voldemort's amazing skills, um, he found this uh, basically a course list. Um, this is just a tiny bit of it. Um, I don't know at all what the Cyrillic characters say, but you can pretty clearly see the Linux and Red Hat show up here. And the next page has things about Windows and all sorts of different, um, different operating systems and protocols. So um, they set up this huge battery of courses that they are training uh, people in this eighth director to, to work with. And so um, it's things about software and finding vulnerabilities there, um, things about computer network security, as well as um, some things about um, uh, the actual hardware infrastructure. 
So how to, um, I think one of them was how to sort of tap information on a, uh, on a drive without actually uh, harming the drive, um, like a physical tap, as well as how to um, sort of repair and service um, Macintosh computers, um, Apple computers. So um, they don't call it Macintosh, they um, how to work with Apple computers and do that hardware. So that clearly seems to point to um, to actual uh, not just defensive operations but also offensive ones. Um, they're learning across all all of these um, platforms and uh, and uh, physical infrastructure. Um, so um, there's some more information about how these uh, infrastructure cadets, like who they are and what happens with them. Um, so officially, they train at the um, General Shchemenko Military Institute, which is supposedly the only Russian military academy that deals with this defensive information. Um, and they also uh, train people from six different countries in the Collective Security Treaty Organization. So Russia and um, five post-Soviet countries. Um, so they all have people coming here, presumably <coughs> learning these same skills. And um, they also started this thing uh, in 2013, a campaign to have different research companies. Um, and so they actually were uh, inviting people uh, who were emerging from college uh, at the top of their classes to actually come and train at these institutes and, um, and spend their year of mandatory service um, at these institutes. And then they were highly encouraged from there to actually take a job there and continue working for the military. Um, and so some of them are uh, stationed at the Stomenko Institute and are military cyber defenders. Um, so to get a better sense of linking these, um, this sort of amazing organizational map that uh, Volkmir has put together um, with what's actually happening on the ground, um, we can also look at geography and Google Trends. So there was a blog that pointed out um, that in, uh, in October of 2015, that some of the most charged political terms um, showing up on Google Trends were actually originating in very, very small towns. So, um, so four small towns, um, most of the, so there were 4,000 people, 200 people, less than 3,000 people, the biggest one of those was 30,000 people. So they were at the top of the list for a lot of um, contentious political terms, like Maidan, which is a um, symbol of Ukrainian pro-democracy, um, forces. It's uh, a new sort of town square where a lot of the protests were taking place. Um, and sanctions, referendum, NATO, and Poroshenko, one of the politicians. Um, so all of these things were very contentious. And um, all those four tiny places were showing up at the very top of Google Trends. Um, when we look, um, we're looking specifically at the term meta. Um, and I apologize for those of you who do speak Ukrainian. I'm probably saying it way off. Um, but uh, so these are those four tiny towns. And then looking further, um, we can see this point here is um, that military institute that I was just talking about. That is the uh, military's institute for training people to do these um, to do this hacking. And so two of these tiny towns are actually within about a mile of it. So uh, you can guess that, they're that that institute is probably um, either directly responsible and they're uh, well -known <coughs> sort of contributed there, or there's a little bit of spread around where the, where the cadets do their work. Um, similarly, um, this third place um, with strangely high um, uh, reports about the uh, Ukrainian Square is actually uh, very close to the institute, an institute run by the FSB, which is the successor to the KGB. Mm. Um, and if you, uh, I wish I could say more about this last one. The fourth place is um, you'll, you know, a troll factory. And I would highly recommend you look at um, Adrian Chen's article in the New York Times Magazine about this, um, about this troll factory, um, just to get some of the flavor of it. But um, one of the amazing things that he traced back to this was um, they had a, a massive disinformation campaign um, on September 11th, 2014, um, where they said there was a massive chemical explosion in Louisiana. 
and they, uh, they were also planting seeds to say, oh, and ISIS did it. Um, and so they had a lot of fake Twitter accounts that posted about this, and they targeted uh, local news to say, hey, you haven't reported on this. This is amazing. What do you think is going to happen? Or tweeting at Karl Rove to say, hey, do you think it was ISIS that did this? Um, so they didn't just like doctor that screenshot that was in the tweet. They also um, cloned websites of the Louisiana local papers and had articles about this. Um, they created YouTube videos that showed some guy watching Al Jazeera and uh, reporting on this and where the fake Al Jazeera in the YouTube video was saying that, um, that ISIS was claiming responsibility, created a Wikipedia page, and <laughs> amazingly they sent text messages <coughs> to local residents warning them about this. So um, it, it was just this amazingly coordinated campaign. <laughs> So, um, I mean, so compared to the Qatar hack, where they just uh, sort of violated one government website with an inflammatory message, um, they were really trying to um, induce panic and just see how far they could go um, here. So um, this Olgino Control Factory um, was actually a supposedly private entity um, that seems to be funded by one of uh, Latin American's pals. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm sure they're all patriots, and that's, that's why they're uh, writing what they are online, and that's what they're doing all of these things. That's why they're doing all these things. But um, yes, so officially there are troll factories. Oh, there are troll factories like this that uh, are not officially run by the government, but um, seem to be sowing chaos and doing a lot of other things uh, that uh, we should watch out for. Um, so this, uh, this reporter, Adrian Chen, also uh, followed up on some of the lists of trolls that he found on Twitter and YouTube and everything else. And he did find that a lot of those uh, accounts, um, he said in December 2015, that they actually uh, turned into fake conservative accounts. And so we've heard this narrative, or at least if you have, uh, if you followed any American political news in the last year, and I, I hope for those of you from other countries, you haven't had to do that very much. But um, yeah, we've heard some of this, that uh, some of the same Russian bots that were promoting Russian things um, turn into pro-Trump bots. Um, that's not to say necessarily that, um, how should I put this, that that doesn't necessarily impugn every Trump supporter, or, like having bad, uh, bad people on your side is not necessarily uh, damning for your case, but um, I'll leave it there. Um, so basically, uh, there is so much more that, uh, that Voldemort could tell you, and I'm hoping that we can get him on Skype for the Q&A. Um, so we're going to try to put that up and hope the microphone works. But. Um, so we were, uh, for this presentation, trying to zoom in on who is it who's being trained um, and who has control. The, the part about control seems, the analysts seem to think that uh, Putin's at the top and um, knows what's going on, and then there's a lot of different entities that are doing things, not necessarily with coordination between them. So in the Hack of the Democratic National Committee, again in the US, for those of you blessed enough not to have heard about this, this American news, um, the DNC hacks seem to be done by two different groups, and um, for a little bit of levity. Um, so just a quick mnemonic, Fancy Bear is the FSB, um, also known as um, uh, uh, Advanced Persistent Threat 29, and then Cozy Bear, represented here by the amazing Canadian uh, bear Winnie the Pooh, um, is uh, a part of the GRU, it looks like, um, Advanced Resistance Threats 28. So, um, further directions for this work, um, some of which are in the paper, um, and we just can't cover in this presentation. Um, of some of the other people involved are criminal hackers, and Russia seems to be notorious for, um, for catching people who are doing hacking and then saying, oh, you don't really have to go to prison if you help us. <laughs> and then uh, they sort of license people to do monetary crimes around the world, um, and as well as long as they also help um, with state efforts. 
Um, they also are have clubs like the Young FSB Cyber Warriors mm -hmm. that are training to be computer scientists in high school. Um, they uh, are sponsoring people. Um, or they take a very keen interest in these institutes in the people who win um, global ACM programming competitions. Um, and Voldemir has also done extensive research on the 12 research companies that um, that are some of which, even though they're kind of clandestine, have some traces online. So um, and, and have had people speak out about them. Sadly, um, we can expect that there will be further attempts to meddle in elections around the world. Um, the German elections are coming up, and um, future U.S. elections. Um, it's a saddening to see how everything uh, we keep having new headlines um, that either are relevant or seem to be relevant. Um, and while Russia is not necessarily the only actor, and North Korea seems seems to be the one behind the WannaCry virus, say. Um, that we need to be vigilant about um, about protection for ourselves, for our institutions, for our countries. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I wish I could have a like easy answer for all this. Um, also, uh, we should be aware that there could be attacks that are not just um, information and disinformation, but rather um, paired with uh, attacks on the infrastructure. Like in Ukraine, there was an attack on a power station um, actually during the middle of winter, so that was an um, extremely dangerous attack. Um, or attacks that are linked with um, atta information attacks or disinformation that are linked with, um, with military weapons. Um, so thank you so much. Again, um, these are my colleagues. And um, please, uh, Volkmir, we love your questions and emails. And, I will also see if I can plug you in if we do Q&A. So, thank you so much.